Our speaker for today, Blair. I don't remember. I'm going to look for his last name. Hold on. Turn around. <laughs> uh, so, as you can see, encryption, be encryption best practices. All right, you ready? Here we go. Blair Semple, C I S S P I S. Don't do that, William. Don't do it? No. You don't have to do all that. All right, he's a cool guy. I'll he knows what he's it. doing. According to this full page, he knows what he's doing. Oh, you only so got the one page it. version? I thought you had the three page version. So do I have to read it because it's one page? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It says NSA on here, so be careful. <laughs> so Blair, go ahead and take yeah, it. Yeah, thanks. So first of all, I too would like to thank all you guys for showing up. Um, you got some pretty exciting stuff going on here between top golf and bowling and filling the room. The last one of these I did was actually at a Maggiano's in Milwaukee and six people showed up. So. Uh, this is really exciting for me. It's making me think I might need to relocate to Texas or something. Uh, as William would have said, if I, if I had let him, my name is Blair Semple. You can see I'm a CISSP, ISSCP, CCSP, MOUSC. Um, uh, I'm, uh, I work for a company called Jamalto. Now, before you guys signed up, how many people knew Jamalto? Well, that's a little better than we normally get. How many people knew a company called SafeNet? I know it's unfair I'm making you raise your hands while you're trying to eat, but I'm jealous. So um, early last year, uh, a company called SafeNet, which I and most of my colleagues worked for, was acquired by Jamalto. So some of you knew you SafeNet. I'll give you a little bit of background on Jamalto. Although I have some slides, I'll do it right now. Uh, we can do it pretty easy. How many of you have cell phones in your pocket? How many of you have credit cards that have a chip on it? How many of you have a passport with an RFID chip in it? So most of you probably have Jamalto technology, you just didn't know it. Legacy Jamalto Technologies really been focused on embedded security capabilities, SIM cards, chip and pin cards, embedded passport technology, etc. And I think a big part of the reason why they were interested in SafeNet is the reason why when I said SafeNet most of you put your hands up, because SafeNet had user facing enterprise products and was really a way to help bring the name out. So all, the, all of us that used to be SafeNet uh, are now Jamalto employees. I'm not going to talk a lot about product today, but you'll also see that we've maintained the SafeNet brand in some of our products. So for those of you that are actually consumers of SafeNet technology, you'll recognize that. Now before we get too far into it, and uh, because today is the first day of the US Open, I'm going to ask a couple more questions and ask you guys to indulge me. How many people actually play golf? Oh, come on. You can't all be eating there. That's better. How many watch golf on television? A little few more. How many have ever been to a PJ Tour event? How many have ever been to a PGA Tour major? How many have ever caddied on Sunday in a PGA Tour major? Really? I'm the only one? Bad part's my computer's back here. So I was fortunate last year at Whistling Straits on Sunday in the PGA Championship. I got to carry a bag, was on television a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to waste a lot of time telling you that story because I could use all my time on it. But if any of you were curious to talk about it, I'd be happy to do so afterwards. What I'd like to do today, and it's always a little bit of a crapshoot in a crowd like this, because I know I've got guys in this room that are way smarter than me on security things, and I know I've got guys in this room that probably don't have a lot of exposure to information security. So I'm going to go back a little bit. Some of you will be very bored at the start, so you can enjoy your food early. Um, talk a little bit about uh, history of data security and data protection. Talk to you about some of the things I see in the current landscape of how we're applying data security into the enterprise, and then some of the things we're starting to see change, how there's a bit of a paradigm shift going in the way that, that people do it. I'll be very honest with you, some of my examples are going to be storage focused, and some of that's because of my background. So if I had let William talk, he would have talked to you about a few things. I really started cutting my teeth in information security by hanging out at Fort Meade for seven years. I was involved in a program called the Remote Access Security Program, which I can talk about now. So if you go back to the late 90s, remember laptops used to have PCMCIA cards, credit card sized slots. We actually built an encrypting modem that went in one slot and then an encryption token that went in the other slot and we could encrypt the local hard drive in the, in the laptop and then encrypt the communications. So it was actually the first solution that allowed people to mobily go into a hotel room or, or go from home perhaps and dial in and access classified information over the telephone and then store that data on their laptop because they had security at both sides. I transitioned from that into starting to apply security into enterprise storage systems probably about 12 years ago. Uh, I worked at NetApp for six years. Some of you might know NetApp, big storage company. I was their primary security evangelist. So it was kind of weird for me then because I was a security guy and I worked at a storage company where in those days security was kind of something nobody wanted to talk about. So I was the weird security guy at a storage company. And then as SafeNet started to spin up some solutions in the storage area, I went to work for SafeNet and now I was the weird storage guy at a security company. So I tend to not fit in wherever I go. 
But you know, as I've been involved in that enterprise storage space for about a decade, and so a lot of the examples I'm going to give you are going to be storage focused, but I think the stories behind them will, will apply to everything. As I mentioned, I had a little bit of things I have to tell you about Jamalto because they paid me to, to come down here and watch you guys eat. So, you know, these are some of the areas that we, that we play in. A lot of it in that embedded technology. We do a lot with software monetization, helping companies create things like licensing models for their software and license enforcement. Obviously, Internet of Things is, I think, the thing that's going to dramatically change the world for all of us, good and bad. I like to think of myself as a security professional, yet I also love to stand up and brag about all the things I have in my house that are now connected to the Internet. You know, it's this uh, bipolar thing that we have that, you know, I could take my phone out right now and open my garage door. That's really cool, but it's kind of a security problem, too. Um, my favorite story recently, I'm a big, also big Amazon Echo person. My favorite story recently is the video that got a lot of press of the guy who unfortunately called his car Kit, which I didn't like, but where he said, Alexa, move Kit out of the garage, and the garage door went up and the Tesla backed out on its own. It's really cool stuff, but it's also pretty scary. And we'll go into some examples about that as we go as well. You can look at the logo slide for yourself. Obviously, a uh, large company, 3.1 billion euro company, 14,000 employees. All right, let's talk about some of the, the more fun stuff. Again, this is the part where I warn you guys, some of you are going to be really bored with this. So if we go back far enough in time, uh, we start realizing that we had information and that information needed to be kept confidential. So one of the first things we saw was the Caesar cipher, right? How could this ever not go wrong? We basically had characters in an alphabet and we said, we're going to send a message, take every character and move it three slots forward or five slots forward or eight slots back and encrypt the entire message. Ironically, there was a point in time where that worked pretty well. We then move on to a siddly, basically a pole, a diameter with a fixed diameter where you could wrap it in uh, parchment or wrap it in leather, carve out a message on the parchment or the letter, take the leather out. The key, in a sense, in this was the diameter of the rod. So if you had a rod of a different diameter, when you wrapped the message around it and you tried to find the message, it wouldn't decode. So again, it worked for a very long time. But you see, in both these cases, we had a message or a piece of information. We changed it, and we had a key, which was how you get it back. Then we start getting into mechanical stuff. And Enigma is something, I'm not going to say I've studied a lot, because there's a lot of experts, but it's something that I find fascinating. Because we all tend to think of Enigma as World War II, and that's where it all started. It was actually around as a commercial device prior to World War II, used a lot. So you can see the first patents in 1918. Um, obviously, I think everyone now is starting to see the movies. There's a lot of great movies, a lot of great TV shows around talking about this. I was fortunate one of the best, uh, although today will go down as you know, my best place to go give a talk at Maggiano's in Plano, Texas. But I did get to give a talk at Bletchley Park once. And that was pretty cool, too, because we got to do a private tour, see the way the cryptographers and the code breakers lived. Um, see some of the, the machines that they used, etc. Does everyone kind of understand the way that Enigma worked? You would basically have, there's different counts. This one that I have a photograph of has three. So there were three wheels that went in there. You would set the key by rotating those wheels to a fixed position. And then when you had a message, you would type a key and an electrical signal would go through those wheels, get reflected back through those wheels, and it would light up another key on the keyboard. And so when you press A, it turned into a P. So now you use P as that code and you typed out your message. Does anyone know what the issue was with Enigma? Why it was effectively cracked a little easier than it needed to be? Because the Germans sent out a message at the start of day going, oh, this is the start of day message. So that's part of it. That's not the one I was going for, Chris. But so what Chris said, which is right, is you basically had to, at the start of every day, like so the ships at sea would say at 12 o'clock it was 58 degrees and the winds were 12 miles an hour. So if I had the message that was encrypted, that was one of the things I could use to decrypt it. But from a cryptography standpoint, does anyone know what the mistake was, that the flaw was? The early device is a character could not encrypt to itself. So basically, if you hit a P, it could encrypt to every character except a P. So we, you know, one of the things we use when we start to look at encrypted messages or encrypted pieces of storage or anything that's encrypted is we know that there are frequency rates of the usage of characters. So if you know that E is the most common character and you look at all the things and you notice there's no E's in there, that probably means E, you know, you kind of can work back from what that was. So that was kind of the fundamental flaw. Enigmas, um, you know, now are around. I'm surprised how many there are. Uh, I mentioned I worked at NSA. At, in Maryland, there's the National Cryptographic Museum. They have a couple. When I went to Bletchley Park, they have probably 30 on display. It's even at the point now when we do the RSA show, we actually put an Enigma machine in our booth so you guys can come and touch it. But, you know, Enigma involves the, the number of wheels evolved, the number of spots on the wheel evolved, but it's still fundamentally the same.
So that's mechanical encryption. And then we start moving into electronic encryption. So as we had electronic devices processing data, we had the ability to do security on that. A lot of it starts with things like DES, which in the 70s everyone said, this is great, nothing's ever going to happen with this, we're good. And then, well, we had a problem, so then we said, well, let's just run it through there three times and call it triple DES. But, you know, we've seen these standards evolve now. We've gone through government-specific ones. The products I mentioned earlier that I worked with on the RAS program used a, an algorithm called Skipjack. The overall technology was called Fortez. I see lots of heads nodding. I don't know why this never caught on. I mean, it was developed by the government, and they said, here, commercial world, you should go ahead and use this. And it had a field called the LEAF field. Does anyone know what LEAF, the acronym, stands for? The Law Enforcement Access Field. Go ahead, encrypt all your data with this secure algorithm we're going to give you. We don't need to know your keys, but there's a back door built into it for us. So, you know, th this idea, the evolution of algorithms, I think, has really changed. But now we're at a point where you can see the majority of, of organizations consider that they have a significant deployment of encryption capabilities within their enterprise. You were focused on the screen. You didn't get me waving, I guess. So I, t I warned you guys I was going to talk a little bit about storage, and I'm not going to go through every word on this slide, don't worry. But the reason that I use this slide a lot is this is talking about the threats that apply to stored data. So basically, we all work in networks. We have computers. We attach them to networks. We send that data in somewhere to a network storage repository in the middle. Maybe the enterprise replicates it from a primary facility to a DR site. There's disks. There's tapes. There's all kinds of things. The important thing, ab whoops. The important thing about this slide is that it reflects that the threats are different based on where your data is. So I can apply encryption capabilities to a tape. That was one of the very first things we saw, encryption in the enterprise. I could encrypt my backup tapes. Well, that's great while the data is on the tape, but it doesn't help me when the data is on a disk or while the data is flying through a network or while somebody's processing the data. So these threats all change. And the thing that's important to me when I talk to customers is you can't say what the important priorities are in this for any given organization. Every organization is different. And even within an organization, every set of data is different. So to some people, things like disk theft, they might be really worried about. And to other organizations, they're going to say, I'm not worried about somebody stealing a disk. And I can give you a real simple example. Some of you, I'm imagining, work for very large enterprises. You have big data centers, thick walls, man 7 by 24, maybe guys with guns out front. Well, the th risk of somebody stealing a disk there is a lot different than an organization that maybe has a small data center or multiple data centers. Some of them in a strip mall, some of them aren't manned 7 by 24, and in the middle of the night, someone can break in and steal the disks. So how do you, how do you determine how high a priority that is? You, have to, you guys all know this. You have to look at the value of the data, the impact of a, of a, of a successful vul uh, vulnerability attack, and then, and then decide where you're going to apply it. But we have technology at Jamalto, and we have technology in the industry that plays at all these different levels. So it's really important to look at your data and understand what you really care about. So one of the examples I love to give in storage, I mentioned early on in tape, some of the first things we saw were encrypting tape drives. And the first encrypting tape drive came from a company called Storage Tech. Does anyone remember Storage Tech? And the drive was called the T10K. So the encryption concept is really simple here. The tape drive sees data coming down, it has a key, it encrypts the data, it stores it on the tape. But now we have a little bit of a key management challenge, because typically what would we do with those tapes? We'd put them in a cardboard box, we'd give them to a guy from Iron Mountain, he would drive away, put them somewhere else. Maybe six months, nine months later we need the tape, the tape comes back to us. Well, how do we manage the keys? How do we get the key matched up with the encrypted data? The tape is secure, but how do I actually access my data? Well, in those days, and I know a lot of you are going to laugh when I get to the end of this, but this is very serious. Uh, T10K used something that looked a lot like a USB stick on the front. It would store the tape's key on the, on the USB stick. How did you ensure that you knew had the right stick when you got the tape back from Iron Mountain? You put the tape, the stick in the box with the tape, and you seal it up, and you ship it off. Now, you guys are all, hopefully you're all laughing, but it's legitimately what the solution was. Now, did that solve a problem? I'm going to tell you the answer is yes, because... I was involved in selling quite a few of them. Um, the reason that it solved a problem is this is in the early days of California 1386. One of the first disclosure laws that said if you have a citizen of California's private information and you lose control of it, you have to make a public disclosure. These were heady days for the industry I was in back then because like every week, this bank, this insurance company, this medical company was releasing that they co had compromised 100,000, 200,000, 3 million, 5 million users' information. The law didn't say the information was compromised. It said you've lost control of the information. So a lot of the time, you could hand the box of tapes to Iron Mountain, and they lose the tape. Was the data compromised? Maybe, maybe not. But the law didn't segregate that. You had to make a disclosure. 
The law had what early on we would call a safe harbor clause that said, if it's encrypted, you don't have to tell anybody. Now think about when I put the key in the box with the tape and I seal it up. Was the tape encrypted? Yes, it was. I lost the tape, I didn't have to tell anybody. Not secure, but it was encrypted. And we still see a certain amount of that. I know uh, at my table where there's an auditor, I think you, know, you probably still come across this a little bit, where we've had a lot of cases where regulations haven't defined security as much as something like check the box because the data is encrypted. We're starting to see these things evolve, but it's still a bit of a problem. So again, just recognize that the threats to your data change based on where your data is, and you can solve them all. The other thing, and I know I'm sure there's a lot of CISSPs in the room, we always love to go right to technology to solve problems. But the reality is there's a lot of ways that we can close down threats. Some of them are administrative, how I train my users, how I hire my users. Um, some of them are physical, do I have the guy with the gun in front of the door? And some of them are technology. But it's, it's important to never just rush right to technology. And this is from a guy who sells technology. But it's really important because this is a triangle. And if, if you can have all the technology in the world, but if your processes fail, the technology is not necessarily going to help you. Uh, you can have you know, the thickest walls in the world, but there's still ways that data is going to move around and get out. So it's important to look at all three aspects of applying controls to your data. When we look at the breach landscape, I don't, again, I'm not going to tell you guys anything. The numbers start getting really big. Uh, one thing that you might be interested in, we maintain a second website at Jamalto that we call breachlevelindex.com. It's a website you can go to. It's not about our products. We're not trying to sell you anything. We just watch the news, and when we see information about breaches, we capture what we know about it. And it's a way that you can drill down and see what industries are getting breached, how many records are getting breached. If you're a technology salesperson, it's great, because you can look at uh, a given account you're going into and see if they've had a breach or if any of their competitors have had a breach. And it gives some more specific information about the nature of those breaches. Um, could be the industry, could be you know, what's happened, did it come from the inside, did it come from the outside. Again, I've been doing storage for a long time, so we used to always talk about the FBI report that talked about how 75% of the breaches came from the inside. Didn't necessarily mean it was a bad administrator, well, they were always bad, I guess, but didn't mean it was a rogue administrator. Sometimes it was you made a mistake and the data got out, but it was caused on the inside. That's completely flipped now. We all know that, that these attacks are coming from the outside. And when we look at the nature of breaches, how many have received an email or a letter like this? This is mine from the Home Depot breach from your credit card saying, we got to send you a new credit card. I don't believe you. How many have received letters like this? All right, that's better. Thank you. Um, the other thing that I think is important when we talk about data security and breaches, though, so this happened to me. Boy, this was a pain in the butt for me. I had to go to the, I don't even want to guess how many websites have my credit card number on file now. 20, 30 places had my credit card on file. I had to get new credit cards. I had to change all that stuff. How much did that affect my life? Not very much. And if there had been a fraudulent charge on my card, which there was not from this, I just would have called the credit card company and I would have been fine anyways. So this didn't impact me personally very much. Did impact the credit card company, did impact Home Depot, but um, didn't impact me very much. The other thing that I think is really scary is how, again, how breaches are changing. So that was a case of you know, a, a very sophisticated attacker looking for a list of credit card numbers or social security numbers, et cetera. But uh, you know, if we look, there's two that I like to call out. Sony, which is always hard because when I say the Sony breach, people say which one. Uh, I'm specifically referring to you know, the North Koreans in a movie and all that stuff. That wasn't financially motivated, right? It was an attempt to get someone to change their business practices. And I think the one that starts getting a little scarier is Ashley Madison, was not personally a member. I won't ask who was a member. Um, but you know, that was an attack, again, not financially motivated. Uh, the attackers, uh, which is a part of the story you don't hear often enough, basically said, we know that you, know, you have a business, you're doing this, and you could, well, if you were an Ashley Madison member, I've been told, you could pay an extra fee to guarantee the security of your information. So you paid extra for it. For that, you got absolutely nothing. They didn't do anything to do it, but they charged you extra. So that was revealed as this. But the reason I think the Ashley Madison shows a transition is uh, now we've gone from I had to change some credit card numbers to uh, a lot of people that were on, on Ashley Madison database at least used .mil email addresses. If you're an officer in the United States Armed Services and you have an adulterous affair, it's a crime. And we've had people that have killed themselves because of the damage to their life by their name being published. So you know these breaches are changing. And I think if we take that and we expand it out, I gave the example earlier about the Tesla backing out of the garage on its own. Well, that Tesla is also receiving firmware updates overnight that you don't even know about. Now imagine someone gets in and starts messing with that. Uh, one article I read, something that I'm really interested in, is talking a lot about autonomous cars. 
and the concept that when I buy an autonomous car that's going to drive itself, I have an expectation that that car is going to protect me because it's my car. But if you think about it morally, we're going to get to the point where this car knows that that's a school bus next to it. And I can drive into the school bus, maybe wipe out the school bus, but I have a better chance of surviving. Or I can drive myself into that telephone pole and the school bus is just fine. Imagine now if I can start hacking firmware in cars and making simple things like mess with the, lo the algorithms of how you make these decisions, etc. The impact of what these breaches is going to be is going to magnify and accelerate and accelerate over time. We've gone from, you know, someone published a list in the newspaper, or, uh, sorry, a, a company published their name in the newspaper to say we lost a box of tapes through I had to change my credit card number through people killing themselves to every autonomous car in the country might start driving in circles at high speed. Right? The impacts are accelerating of these kinds of things. These are some of the data that you can get if you go to breachlevelindex.com. Uh, you know, not surprisingly, we've seen retail take over a lot. Uh, government is always a funny one because I don't think the government necessarily always reveals what the breaches are. Things like the, um, the uh, OMB breach, which my wife is a federal employee, so she got her letter. I got my letter because she got her letter. I mean, those are all problematic um, and growing quickly. I think the other one that's really starting to show in this is the concept of intellectual property theft. We're starting to see so much more corporate espionage affecting intellectual property, something that organizations used to say, I trust my employees, I trust my services. Now they're recognizing they need to protect their own information. And again, this is the point I was making earlier, that we've gone from 75% came from insider threat to um, now, you know, if you look at accidental loss and malicious insiders, they still don't add up to what we're seeing from the outside. So we know that that concept of let's protect the, protect the per perimeter is not working, and these numbers just continue to go up. So this is a snapshot maybe from a week and a half ago from breach level index. That's a big number. Of course, the way we use technology is changing too. We're starting to have more and more data which is great. When I somehow I stumbled into choosing security and storage as the two things I was going to focus my career on, the two things that never happen is we don't start, stop making more data. There's always more data and it needs to be secured. But that data is also in more and more locations and we're giving up more and more control. Cloud is something that scares everyone, right? I'm going to take data. Boy, it sure would be a lot more efficient and cheaper if I let somebody else manage it for me. It's kind of scary if I let somebody else manage it for me as well. So we have to create a balance in those things. And really for us what that means is we have to identify where your data is and perhaps even more specifically where your sensitive data is. You can't encrypt everything. I still remember when I started working at NetApp, the very first meeting I went to, went to New York City. We sat in a very large bank. I won't, uh, I won't tell you what bank it was, but we were in New York City. And um, uh, they had just been affected by a California 1386 release. CIO, CSO, CISO banged their hands on the table and said, we're going to encrypt every piece of data in this enterprise. And I went. I'm on the beach in six months, never going to have to work again. Well, I'm still working because you can't do it. You simply can't encrypt everything. You've got lots of data. There's a cost to, to secure and encrypt it. You need to prioritize where the most sensitive data is, identify where that data is, and then encrypt it. It's really important that you figure out what you're going to do properly with your keys. I gave you the example earlier, the storage tech tape drive. All the data on those tapes was encrypted. I would argue in most cases it wasn't secure because the key was sitting there right with it. So I have a key management challenge. It's not an insurmountable one, but I have to do my key management properly, ensure that I have good keys, ensure that only authorized users get access to them, but at the same time ensure availability. So availability of keys conflicts with security of them. If I'm going to replicate them to multiple data centers to make sure my keys are always available, I have to make sure that's all done securely and only certain people get access to the keys. And then access control still becomes, it, it, it still stuns me that access control is as weak as it is globally. You know, we've had things like two-factor authentication and proper authentication mechanisms for so long, yet so much still relies on passwords. One of the root causes of the, the Sony breach that I talked about was an attack on the network where the attackers found a flat text file in the network. And what did that flat text file contain? All the usernames and passwords of the administrators. I don't think that was a very good idea, yet it still happens in large enterprises. And things, again, like two-factor authentication. Now, there's so many ways you can deploy two-factor authentication. We sell solutions where you can use your mobile phone as your token. So you go to log in, a message comes to your phone. You know, there's, there's layers of authentication that don't have to be uh, aggressive on the user in terms of making things really uh, unusable for them. And of course, you know, the, for those of you who do run your own infrastructures, though, 
Uh, one of the challenges in all that is you always have the executives who don't want to follow the rules, and as soon as the executives don't follow the rules, the whole thing comes down. So what does that come back to? Remember earlier when I said administrative is equally as important as control? At some point, we're all going to have to put our foot down to the president or the CEO of the company and say, no, you can't just have a password. You have to have a token like everyone else. When we look at applying encryption and data security to data, if you think of that diagram I had earlier where I showed the data moving around, that was just another way of showing the stack where data is going to flow from the application, the user facing scenario, all the way down to wherever that media or the, the data actually lands on media. If it's storage, if it's disk, if it's tape, if it's flash, wherever that media lands. And I think it's important to understand that in a perfect world, if I employ encryption all the way at the source, so the user's sitting at a computer, he's creating some data, if I can encrypt it right there, I would argue that's the most secure way to do it. And I would argue that because the data is going to move through the network encrypted, it's going to get processed by storage, and all the network's encrypted, it's going to land on media, and it's going to be encrypted. But it's also the most difficult place to do it because we've got users, and users aren't always the smartest people in the world, and we can't always trust them. Um, all those users run different operating systems, different applications, different patch levels. Those things move around. They're laptops. Oh my gosh, they're out of the data center, etc. Conversely, doing encryption at the media level, so tape in that first example I gave, but now you know, self-encrypting drives are becoming ubiquitous. I personally believe in the next two to three years you won't be able to buy a hard drive that's not a self-encrypting drive because why would the manufacturers keep making them if they cost the same? So now you'll have encryption down here very easily at the storage level but you get the least amount of control. You can't control when the data is encrypted, what keys are used to encrypt what data. Um, the data is going to flow through the network in the clear. So you have this trade-off. And the challenge that comes in, I have a theme, and, and my Jamalto colleagues better yell this out when I ask the question, or they'll never get me to come to Texas again. Um, is So I can encrypt data at all these different layers. Which is the best place to encrypt the data? Depends. It depends. Who said it? All right, Doug. All the other guys don't work for Jamalto anymore. It depends because I don't know what's important to you and I don't know how you can have, how, what your enterprise looks like and where you can deploy it. The important thing is that you have a toolkit of data protection, data encryption capabilities that allows you to deploy the right solution for the right set of data at the right place. I'll often joke, uh, and we, I actually did this at dinner last night, I'll often joke, I do have a very guaranteed way that I can secure your data. We encrypt it and we throw away the keys. The problem is Users tend to want to access their data. So we can't really control uh, what's the best way to do it for any given data set. Each data set is going to speak for itself. But it's important you look at deploying multiple types of technology and then find as much common infrastructure, in other words, key management, as you can use. So key management, Gartner would say, is the heart of, of encrypting data. I don't know how you guys feel about Gartner. Um, these are, this is basically what a key manager does. It needs to generate keys. There's good encryption keys and there's bad encryption keys. You can generate good ones and you can generate poor ones. It needs to store them because obviously when we encrypt the data, sometimes we're going to want to get the data back. I need to distribute them, which basically means I might want to replicate those keys to multiple locations or I might want to hand them out to authorized people or entities who have access and authorization to get access to the data. Rotation is an interesting concept. So in uh, some of the NIST standards, they use the, the concept of crypto period. How much data should I encrypt with one key and then maybe move on to another key? So don't encrypt all your data with one key because if that one key gets compromised, all your data gets compromised. And how long do I want to keep data encrypted with one key? Remember, if I have in a, in a modern world, if I have a piece of data, so you keep it really simple, I have a Word file and I encrypt it with a key, that file is going to keep getting backed up in the network and all those things. So do I want that single key to protect that data forever? Or maybe every now and then do I want to change that key? So that if the old key is compromised, it doesn't affect the new one, or if the new key is compromised, it doesn't affect the old one. So key rotation is really important. And then key termination has a whole other set of uh, aspects to it. Again, I, I've told you guys several times, my background is in storage. So let's say, for example, we had a piece of data we put in a storage network, and we said, we have to keep this data for seven years. I remember the good old days when it was one year, and then three years, and then five. Seven's a really common one now. So we said, I have to keep this data for seven years. At the end of that seven years, should I let a storage administrator destroy the key? Jamalto colleagues, what's the answer? It depends. I can give you examples why I might want to. I might want to say, let's free that storage up. Let's let the storage guy destroy the key. There's a flip side to it, though. What if two weeks before we got a subpoena that said, bring this data to court? Does the storage guy know that? Probably not. So now the data hits the end of its life cycle, he destroys the key. Someone has to stand up in front of the judge and say, we can't give you the data that you subpoenaed, 
And by the way, we destroyed it a day after we got the subpoena. That's not really good. Okay, so that idea of who can destroy data, because destroying keys effectively destroys data, is something that needs to be factored in. What we actually have in our product is the ability where you can take a key offline. So at the end of that seven years, the key goes offline. The data is still there, but if a person or a process tries to access it, they can't get access to it. And then someone with a higher level of authority, higher level of credentials, can actually destroy that key and terminate the data. So it's something that needs to be thought about, though. You can't just you know, blindly say, destroy the keys. And of course, the availability aspect is one that I think is so important. Uh, I, I get a little frustrated now some of the times as we're, si we're seeing more and more organizations deploy encryption and they want cheaper and cheaper key management. Companies that are starting to say, we don't need high availability in our key management because that costs money. So they say, let's just buy one key management thing. Well, that's great. It saves you some money and it's easier to get stood up. But if that one key management thing blows up, you've lost your keys. And when you've lost your keys, you've lost your data. So you need to factor that into it. And then, of course, there's a million ways they try to get around. Well, we'll back it up. Well, if you generate a new key every 30 seconds, are you going to back it up every 30 seconds? Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of aspects to the things. You, we take key management for granted, but it's a really important part of what we can do here. The other thing, this relates, I guess, a little bit to where I encrypt my data. So if I have unstructured data in a database, I'm going to apply a certain suite of technologies, perhaps, to encrypt that. I could encrypt it at the disk level, way below the database, and get less inherent security value. I could encrypt it higher and higher and higher up the stack and get that higher level of security, um, but I need to pick and choose. Unstructured data, and, and I'll be honest with you, in the organizations I work with, structured data is getting more and more under control now. Unstructured data is still the wild, wild west. Everybody's got PowerPoint files, Excel files, Word files. There's very little control over that. And in many cases, that's where a lot of the sensitive data is, especially when we talk about the intellectual property argument that I gave you guys a little bit earlier. And of course, cloud changes all that again, too. If I'm going to start migrating data to the cloud, oh my gosh, now what am I going to do? Uh, I'm handing data off to a service provider. I could uh, hand it off to a service provider and trust that the service provider is going to encrypt it, because they told me they will. But they might hold on to those keys. So now how much trust do I put in that? Um, I could encrypt it myself and let them hold the keys. I have to trust them. Or I could encrypt it myself and hold the keys myself and only hand them off encrypted blobs of data. Again, the trust level is different there. So there's a technology trade-off. So where we see most deployments focusing or, or coming from for the solutions we sell is, a, is in a couple different areas. And, and these vary, the nature of these vary as I go through them. Compliance is still a driver. 12 years ago, compliance was the only driver for data security encryption in the enterprise. Now, as I mentioned, the awareness of intellectual property, uh, et cetera, organizations are deploying it because deploying it it's, the, it's the right thing to do. How many people in the room know what KMIP is? Again, I'm asking you to raise your hands because I'm jealous because now you got the real good food on the table. No one knows what KMIP is? Wow. So KMIP is an acronym. It stands for Key Management Interoperability Protocol. It's basically an OASIS standard that defines, it was, it was built for storage, although it's being used for bigger things now, that defines how something that encrypts talks to a key manager. It's that simple. Uh, we've had in the past a lot of attempts at a standard for key management. I was actually very involved in one when I worked at NetApp. I actually had an MBO for this, and I, I hit my MBO. I had to get an industry standard key management protocol. And I worked with IEEE, and we basically took what was in our own NetApp products and we jammed it down IEEE's throat, and we got it approved. Still is approved. IEEE P1619.3. The total number of companies that built to IEEE P1619.3 were NetApp and Brocade. So it kind of failed. I got out of the key management standard business, and Oasis starts up KMIP. Now in the KMIP world, we have about 60 different manufacturers that build products that support KMIP and over 100 products that are in the market today. What that means is, and I'll give you a graphical example in a minute, but you used to have to deploy unique key management structures for each of your encryption solutions. You had to buy multiples, you had to manage multiples. Now you can have a common key management infrastructure and make it available as a service to all the things that do encryption in your enterprises. Obviously, virtualization and cloud have really driven adoption of encryption. Uh, the integrations that come from things like KMIP, so it's no longer you have to go buy a key manager for this product and a different key manager for that product. It makes it much more of a service. Consolidation of data centers, whether it's physical or virtual, again, drives sharing of information, putting more and more information together. Uh, just general awareness of cybersecurity. IoT, I talked about earlier. I think IoT is going to be the next big thing. The last presentation I saw, I believe, said there is 7 billion IoT devices in the world today. And in 2020, there will be 500 billion IoT devices in the world. And all of those things generate data. 
Right? That's why they're there. They're there to generate data. Whether it's my garage door generates a message that says the door opened or closed, whether it's a webcam, ring.com doorbells, everybody's going to have those at some point. All these things are generating data. They're all connected. We have to secure them and we have to secure the data. I got to tell you, your food smells awfully good. <laughs> so where we've come from in the past to today is then with what I've told you, this concept of well, I've got different things in my infrastructure and they need to have security applied to them. So the database guys go out and they solve that problem. They buy something, they build something, they encrypt the data, and they have their own key management system. The storage guys have gone out and bought their own products, uh, used key management and encrypted their part of the deal. Uh, applications, all the things that you see on here, we've had these silos of encryption. And it's helped but it's still problematic. And, and the challenges I would suggest you come from siloing like that are, one, you're buying multiple instances of the same thing. So that's challenging. Uh, it's challenging from a cost perspective. Security policy enforcement's a nightmare. If I want to define a central policy for key management and encryption in my enterprise, but there's 37 guys that are doing it, it's really hard to have control over it. Because a few of them are going to say, well, we can't do that. And others are going to say, we don't want to do that. So it's really hard to enforce that process. You get no value from being able to repeat it. Um, one of the things I think is the biggest problem is if I've got 15 different security systems, what are the chances that I'm going to be able to manage that very securely? I've got 15 different sets of knowledge I need to have. I have to have my people trained. Nobody's going to know all of it. If somebody does know system one and I try to have them work with system two, it's going to look kind of the same, use some of the same phrases, but they're going to make mistakes because it's not exactly the same. So this old siloed approach has really been problematic. And then when we start talking about, you know, in the new modern world, this is something that I can't really wrap my, hever, my head around. In the new DevOps world, I used to do some security code reviews at a previous time in my past. Security code reviews take a long time. Now we've got DevOps operations where they're trying to do code releases every two days, every day. Some are doing multiple code releases a day. How do you do a security review on the code when they're releasing code every 12 hours? It's impossible. So n without having uh, something else, we're really affecting their ability to be as flexible and as, as efficient as they can be. So you know, if we all agree that what we need to do is protect the data, however that works, and I've used a lot of the phrase of encryption, but there's a lot of ways that I can protect the data. Tokenization is another one that's really important. These just become tools that I apply to my data, and it's really important that we protect those keys I have to manage that key life cycle from generating secure keys all the way through to what do I do at the end of a piece of information's life cycle? What do I do with those keys? And how do I ensure that those keys are only available to certain individuals? Uh, it's certainly a best practice that you decouple your keys from your data. This again is the concept of do I put the USB stick in the box with the tapes? Well, it's, it's encrypted, but it's not secure. So we've come a long way now where organizations are recognizing maybe storing the key on the disk or storing the key with the tape isn't the best way to do it. Uh, again, uh, and I apologize if you guys aren't interested in storage, that's most of the stories you're going to get from me today, but how many people know self-encrypting drives? How many people know how they actually work from a key perspective? So all self-encrypting drives work exactly the same way, whether it's in your laptop, whether it's in your big multi-million dollar storage system. Self-encrypting drives leave the factory with an encryption chip on them, which is what makes them good. They all have their own encryption brain, and that's how they keep up with performance, and they do all the good things that self-encrypting drives do. And they leave with a key. And that key automatically encrypts all the data that's written to the drive, and it automatically decrypts all the data that's read back from the drive. And for purposes of this, I'll, its real name is the data encryption key, so I'm going to call it the DEC. Where do you think you store the DEC in a self-encrypting drive? I'm sorry? Right, you store it on the drive itself. Basically, it's, it's stored on the drive. And the reason that that's important is sometimes you do take the drive out and you move it. And if you're, gonna be prop, if, you, if you're an authorized user, you have to have the key available to be able to access the data that's on the drive. Same as the box with the, key, with the USB stick in it. So all self-encrypting drives, you can buy them, you can plug them in your laptop. If you don't do anything else, that key is there. So what I have is a bunch of encrypting data with a key that's sitting on the drive. Just like the USB stick in the box with the tape. The way that it becomes secure is you take that data encryption key and you encrypt it with another key called the key encryption key that, or the KEK. Some people call it the access key or the authentication key. That basically now when that drive powers on, it says, I've got encrypted data, I need access to my key. It has to get that authentication or that, key, that KEK from somewhere else. And you separate them. So that when I steal the drive, 
All I have is an encrypted drive with, a, with an encrypted key and it does me no good. I'm amazed at the number of solutions I've seen deploy where they use self-encrypting drives and they don't go through that second step. It's all over again, it's the, uh, you have, I have encrypted data but the key's sitting with the data. So it's, it's encrypted but it's not secure. So a very important best principle to separate those things. So when we look at applying capabilities into all of these things, I gave you the process a little bit earlier. You gotta go out and figure out where your data is, where it's sensitive, you gotta prioritize the analysis you do on that. And then you can apply encryption to it using a myriad of different technologies. Some might come from Jamalto. So, sorry, William, this is the one part where I'm going to list product just a little bit. So we have a product called, for example, Protect V. The V stands for virtualization. We can encrypt VMware VMs uh, and all the data that's written out of a, of a VM. Kind of a cool idea because everyone inherently understands the idea of encrypting all the data that comes out of a VM from inside the VM. Why would I ever want to encrypt the VM itself? VM typically just contains operating system applications. Why would I want to encrypt it? If I want to start an encrypted VM, what do I need? Key? If I separate the key, now anyone who gets their hands on the VM can't start the VM. So let's think cloud for a second. What happens in the cloud? Cloud provider has my VM. They can make a million copies of it. They can try to start them up, but they never can. All the data, they can make a million copies of, but they can never access it because the system's not running. So it's a way of, in, of applying security into virtualized infrastructures. In the database world, we have a product called ProtectDB that allows you to apply uh, column level uh, encryption to your database. We have a product called Tokenization Manager that allows you to apply tokenization. Uh, we have a product called Protect File that allows on a Windows or a Unix host to encrypt files, folders, or volumes. Uh, and we have a product called Protect App, which is a toolkit that if you're building your own applications, allows you to actually write this encryption capability into those applications. Now with those as your encryption tool set that allow you to go do all these things, what's the one thing that happens when you start encrypting data? You start having keys. So now we have to store those keys properly and do the things that a key manager does that I described a little bit earlier. So we have a suite of products that we call Key Secure that run the range from a software only virtual machine that does key management, uh, through a low-end piece, a low, a mid-tier hardware device, through a high-end uh, hardware device that has redundant power supplies, redundant hard drives, and a FIPS 140-2 level 3 HSM inside the box. But these things all run on the standards that I've been describing. So you have the ability to start plugging in encryption capabilities where you need it, deploy key management in the form factor that you need to, and have the ability for all those things to run together. Now I talked about the silos before, what does that look like if we start bringing it all together? So. We've got this concept now where you can have a centralized security or a centralized encryption engine. And if you have that available as a tool set, now when your DevOps guys are doing those releases every 12 hours, they're not touching the security code. They're just touching you know, how, their, how their application works, but they have a trusted core. Now I don't have to do code reviews on that trusted core with every release. I only have to review the security core when I actually uh, update or change the security core. Um, so all these different things that plug into it now can start seeing this as a centralized service. And what that does then is it changes it from before where we had all the silos to this centrally defined service that now can become something all the, the um, I was going to say superficial, which is the wrong word, but all the things on the circumference of the network that need to access those services can take advantage of. So I don't have to build it from the ground up every time. I can start applying now a common set of policies on it. I can say these keys should do this for this long and at the end of the time they should do that. I can start applying all that centrally. Obviously it's going to be a lot more secure to manage because I've got one common core that gets managed. It's not being managed 15 different applications from 15 different people. And ultimately in the end what that does is save you money. So through that transformation, we go from all the silos to the, the nice, unique common core. So again, I, I'm, I'm going to put this slide up, but I'm, I'm not going to go through it as, it represents our products, but I'm not going to talk to you about it from a product standpoint. I just want you to look at it this way. This is a single vendor, happens to be us, that has with this infrastructure all these different things now that can plug into it. So if I give you the key management example via KMIP, as I said, there's now uh, like a, uh, 70 vendors, uh, uh, something like that, of the KMIP vendors that have products with that built in. We've tested and integrated with 100. We don't have to go rebuild the whore or rebuild the cart every time we do that. We just use the standard, we make sure the products work together. And you can see that these are for security points that apply all over the place. You can plug in our products, but you can plug in other companies' products too. And as time goes by, we're going to start seeing, you'll be able to buy just about anybody's security product and plug it in and use just about anybody's key management or infrastructure. Um, protection on top of it. 
And to give you an example, not, not a case study that I know the best, you guys can read some of this for yourself, but if you look at the nature of the company, I think you can figure out who it is. Uh, two billion credit and other payment cards in circulation probably makes it pretty obvious who it is. But you can see that from this, where they, where they were able to come from was having a number of different silos where it was a little bit of wild, wild west. These guys protect it that way, these guys protect it this way, to starting to deploy a, a common security services core and have all the things around it plug into it and take advantage of it. And ultimately, the important thing for them is it saved them a lot of money and they believe made them more secure at the same time, which is a pretty good trade-off. Typically, we think we, sp we spend more money to get a little more secure. This is a case where if you look at the overall enterprise, we save money and we in increase the security profile. So, you know, I think what, what I've tried to convey to you today is a concept that one, this is a hard build slide because it's over here and I have to look this way, uh, allows me to strengthen security. Uh, auditing is something that I didn't really talk about, but if, if my security core is built around a common platform at the time of audit, really what I'm auditing from a security perspective is that common core. So it also reduces the audit requirements and can save me money and time in the auditing phase. Uh, it's going to reduce complexity and cost. It's going to increase your agility, so that idea of being able to, just one second, and then uh, um, uh, increase your ability to do those dev cycles, et cetera. And then, you know, I've mentioned it a few times, but I think a huge part of this, too, is enabling that route to the cloud. The cloud has so much potential, and everybody's just dipping their toe in the water right now because of some of these concerns. That ability of being able to say the cloud just becomes another repository for me or another processing center, but I can control the security core of what I do, I can control my own keys, really does start to enable some magical things in the cloud. I'm sorry, what was your question? Yeah. Are there any particular auditing organizations that this lends itself to better than others, like SSA 16 versus so I don't know if I would go and say that there are any that lend it better to it. I think that um, the concepts that we're deploying are still the same, right? It's still the same idea of how I'm going to encrypt the data, how I'm going to manage my keys, how I'm going to handle user authentication, where I'm going to store my data. It's creating a central way to do that for an enterprise. So instead of having perhaps to go through 15 different audits, it's go through two different audits or four different audits. But the acts, the, the, the capabilities and the services we're providing are the same. We're just providing them in a different form factor. Yes, sir. You suppose you can manage it. Great. Hmm? Next layer now. Within the algorithms, especially with the uh, symmetric algorithms, mm -hmm. you have different modes. Mm -hmm. Vendors typically have seen variances where a vendor will have to use an electronic code book, mm -hmm. which is a known. Right. And if you can use the cipher block chain mode, you've got two uh, things that you have to deal with with a true randomized number generator, mm -hmm. as well as the block, the randomized block. Mm -hmm. Okay. Do your products support. Okay, let's. Uh, what mode of ADS do you support? And do you, within the cipher block chain mode, yeah, so great question. Parts of which I can answer for you, parts of which I can't. Um, so, but I, so I want to I do the concept of what you talked about first. And then, I don't know if that's me or... It is me. I'm resonating, I like that. Um, and then we can talk a little bit more about the specifics and then the others I'll get you the specific answers on. So conceptually, you're absolutely right that different vendors apply different things uh, on their own. And that can be, it's not even different vendors, it's even when you're doing your own internal development or you have these other organizations. So uh, conceptually, what you described I think is a big benefit of moving towards a more common set of data security services that those applications can, can take advantage of, right? So instead of having, you just go build it on your own way and you say triple des is good enough or you, you know, whatever. Uh, and I'm, I'm using the much more obvious examples than yours, which has some subtlety in it. Um, you now have that common set of services. The, the common set of services doesn't have to be locked around any particular approach either, but they can be certified and tested and independently verified core concepts, right? Now, if you want to talk specifically about ours, um, I think I can probably only go as far as saying pretty much everything we do uh, from an encryption standpoint is AES-256, CBC. Uh, I understand the other aspect of your question, but I honestly don't know the answer to it. Yeah, because that's, that's where 
I find a lot of people, well, okay, from a compliance standpoint, mm -hmm. the point of which, oh, yeah, we got AES, okay, so we're good there. Mm -hmm. Not quite. Right. Because it's dependent upon the mode. Absolutely. And then uh, also the key, which you yep. talked about. I totally agree about your uh, security services. The more you can centralize on security service from an architecture perspective, great thing. Yep, absolutely. And and um, you know, even you know, you, when you said ECB, there are ways you can do ECB better than you can do ECB for other things. And for certain applications, performance normally, uh, it might make sense to do it. But you. Like yeah. Uh, let's start to talk offline. Okay. Um, but you know all of these things. So and even tokenization might be you know another example where tokenization as a method of obfuscating data without encrypting it. Th encrypting it. These are all aspects of what that services engine can provide. And I'm not standing up here to tell you today that every single thing we have in our engine does everything that every single enterprise is going to need. But the concept is there, and as we're moving forward, we're seeing more and more people embracing the concept of it. Um, yeah, and I, I reg so when I said that, I probably misled a little bit from what I was trying to say. Uh, there are instances where I can use ECB that aren't necessarily uh, data security on its own, where it's part of other things in the system. We'll, we'll talk about that offline. Yeah. Um, uh, but the core tool set that I want to use needs to be available in, this, in the security services. And needs to be ter tested, independently validated, whether that's FIPS or whatever. And that was the information that I had for you guys. I don't know if there's any other questions. I'm getting a little scared now by the nature of the questions that you guys are going to ask. <laughs> the six people in Milwaukee said, hey, tell me about catting at Whistling Straits. But um, do you guys have any other thoughts, any other questions? Conceptually, I'm willing to bet that all of you who manage security in the enterprise uh, or have a role in security in the enterprise have had these things kind of hit your brain as a concept. I think what I'm trying to convey to you today is it's, it's starting to manifest itself as a real solution that you can start buying and deploying today. All right, well, if there's no other questions, then I'm going to sit down. Benefer's hopefully going to get a plate of food that shows up so I don't pass out. And I know that William's got a few more things he wants to say to you. So I appreciate your time. I hope everyone enjoyed that and you enjoyed your lunch.